Hello. I'm going to talk about combat a lot. Um, no programming, just chatting about combat design. If that bothers you, skip ahead. Um, this is optional, but I still have the flu, so pardon me if I make disgusting noises. Alright, with that in mind, let's talk about our combat. Right now, we just do this swinging forward thing, and it's terrible. But, it exists solely to give us hooks to put things like damage and death into the game engine. Now that those things are there, we can talk a little bit about how to make our combat system a lot more interesting. Well, we have to start by talking about what makes other people's combat systems interesting. So let's start with uh, action RPGs in today's marketplace. Nearly all of them, because they're big budget, they're built for consoles. Because the concept is that PC gamers don't buy RPGs, they only only console gamers do. I'm not sure who thought of that, but they're wrong. Uh, but that's another, that's a completely different story. We won't go into that right now. So with a console controller, you go ahead and hold your left hand something like this. And it controls your movement, because you've got a little thumbstick down here that controls how you move. And that works great, right? Over here, you've got a thumbstick, and then you've got four buttons, four-ish buttons. Now, some games, you put your thumb down here on this other thumbstick. And this is something like Mass Effect, okay? So what happens now is you're controlling your camera with your right thumb, and you're controlling the movement with your left thumb, and then you get these bad boys up here to do your various actions. Now, your actions are going to be pretty limited. You probably only have two primary actions, um, and you have a couple of secondary actions, but uh, you can't really rely on people's finger accuracy with things like pushing down on thumbsticks or right button versus right trigger. Pardon me, still got a little bit of the flu. Um, so generally speaking, if you design a game like this, you have two actions that can be used in the heat of combat. With Mass Effect, that is a pretty simple. You got the shoot and you got the menu. Or you got the shoot and you got the grenade or whatever the setup is. I've forgotten because I only play it on PC these days. Um, but basically, this is a shooter setup, and your RPG can be a shooter if you'd like. Ours is not. So if we think about it like this, this is a setup for pointing the middle of your screen at an enemy's head and then clicking a button, right? Because that's what shooters do. Uh, so you're running around and you're pointing your screen at an enemy's head and you're clicking a button. Now what happens if you're fighting multiple enemies? So if we're looking down from above, you're pointing your uh, your screen at this guy's head while you're over here, right? And you've got your gun, and you're shooting. You're gonna shoot at his at his face, and you're moving in this direction. <coughs> what happens if you suddenly notice that there is a poisonous rad scorpion over here? Well, in order to actually turn and shoot at this obviously much bigger threat you've got to move in the opposite direction while simultaneously turning your camera until you're until you're facing at it and she can shoot it instead this is actually the movement that uh, most newbies can't do um, if you've ever seen someone who hasn't played a first-person shooter that's what they can't do but even if you can do it there's still a delay um, from when you notice the enemy to when you shoot at them it takes a certain amount of time to move your camera accurately into their uh, face. Now, it does depend on the player, but even the fastest players, the camera movement is limited by the speed of the thumbstick. The thumbstick maxes out. It's not like a mouse where you can really whip it faster and faster and faster. The end result is that you don't get a real feeling of crunchiness. Instead, you get a feeling of tension. There's going to be a delay between when you notice an enemy and when you can deal with them. Uh, and sometimes you won't notice an enemy at all if you're in first-person view, but even if you're in third-person view and you can clearly see that there's an enemy, it's going to be a little bit of time before you can move you, the center of your screen over that enemy. Um, and because of that, uh, this sort of thing is very good for tense RPGs, like Mass Effect, where the combat is far more tense than most people like to think. It's a, it's a very tense game in comparison to many others. But let's talk about a different tense game. So this is the free cam system, where you have direct control over the camera at all times. There is the alternative system, which is the lock-on. 
with the lock on, you put your thumb up here on the buttons. Now, uh, why would you want your thumbs on the buttons? Because then you go from having two basic actions to having six. And that's more suitable for most RPGs. Most RPGs really like you to have a lot of buttons. Um, so that gives you things like, oh, you can ju duck, and you can jump, and you can slide, and you can do a big attack and a small attack, and you can do all sorts of other stuff, and it's quite nice, right? But you can't control the camera. Maybe you can, but you have to take your thumb off of the primary action buttons to do it, and that's a big pain in the ass. So these kinds of games generally have you lock onto an enemy automatically. So these games are not about putting the center of your screen on an enemy, because the center of your screen will automatically go on top of an enemy. Now, sometimes this lock-on is very aggressive and is something you have to manually manage. Um, and other times, it's very opportunistic, and just moving in a general direction will automatically lock on to whatever enemy is in that general direction. But either way, there's a stickiness to it, so that your camera is going to always be oriented in some useful direction, as long as the programming isn't terrible. Uh, Dragon's Age and Dragon's Dogma both do this. Um, but... Probably uh, the most noticeable one is Dark Souls, which does this kind of lock-on, and also Batman Arkham Asylum. Those are two kind of opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to combat, but they both use this lock-in system, this lock-on system. Now, the lock-on system is handy uh, for one thing and one thing alone. It's very snappy. So, in this sort of system, you aren't really trying to aim, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to maneuver and find a good spot to attack from and a good timing to attack with. Um, and so in these sorts of games, the, mo the motion either around the enemy or towards and away from the enemy is what really matters. And that means that the other enemies that you might encounter along the way are also going to be important because you need to keep them in mind um, and not get, sides not get uh, surprised by them and stabbed in the side. Because of this, and because of the difficulty of breaking and then reacquiring your reticule, what you normally have in these games is you have a primary attack, which attacks whoever you're targeting, and you've also got some kind of area effect attack or counter. <coughs> so if I'm on if I'm on if I'm locked onto dude A here, and I see that dude B is about to attack me, I can unleash my radius attack and rah, or I can press the block button and counter him. Rah. Um, and all of these actions are perfectly fine. You can even have very passive actions, like you can dodge away from him, uh, but those are super passive, and we won't be we won't be using that kind of passive activity. We want to feel we want to feel like this is a meaty system, not a not a lightweight system. So these are the two basic options when you're designing for a console. The good news is we're not designing for a console. At least I'm not. You might be. We are going to be designing for a keyboard and a mouse. And don't get me started on trying to design action RPGs for phones. Jesus. Well, anyhow, this is the best of both worlds because we do have we do have motion controls over here and we always have camera controls over here. So we always have full camera control. But we also have a number of buttons that are available to us. We have shift, we have control, we have space, we have left click, and we have right click. Um, and I'm, you can use, obviously, other buttons like E or the mouse wheel or the mouse wheel click, but those are generally used for secondary actions, so we're not going to count them as our primary actions. But this gives us a comparable number of primary actions. We have five instead of six. Um, and this means that we can do the best of both worlds. We can try and figure out a good way to do it so that controlling the camera and pressing lots of buttons are both part of the scheme. Now here is the problem. Fundamentally, controlling the camera implies this kind of gameplay, where you are trying to move the camera onto the enemy. Very, very few action games still give you full camera control at all times because most of them realize you probably don't actually need it. I mean, when you're wandering around the town, sure, when Batman is leaping from gargoyle to gargoyle as he explores the city, uh, you usually have your fingers on both of the 
uh, thumbsticks because you can control the camera very well and you can explore much more efficiently. But when you're in combat, it's not so necessary to control the camera. You rarely need to look behind you because you have this nice wide field of vision. <coughs> and fundamentally, if your game is not about pointing the screen at a specific enemy, then why would you need to point the screen at a specific enemy? Why would you need to control the camera? Well, what if there was more to controlling the camera than simply pointing the center of your screen at the enemy? Let's go ahead and uh, come up with a theoretical uh, tactical layout. So here we are with our sword. This is a top-down view, right? And then here's a whole bunch of blobs. So what sort of attack are we going to do? We've got a lot of options. I mean, we could try and come around here and attack from the side, or we could try and bull through, or we could use an area attack to hit all four of them. There's a lot of options here. But what is pointing our camera going to accomplish us? We don't need to be super accurate. It's not like pointing our camera exactly in the center of that blob is going to make us slice it with any more accuracy or skill than just being vaguely in the right spot. So what advantage is there to having our camera specifically focused on one specific blob? There isn't one. But... What about that guy? And this guy? So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the concept of party members. In both free cam and lock-on modes, your party members play support roles. <coughs> For example, in Mass Effect, your party members generally hunker down around whatever seems to be most opportune and just kind of support you with fire from behind. You can call upon them to use their abilities, and those abilities generally work regardless of where they are on the battlefield against any specific target you care to, to, to mention. Uh, so basically their exact position is unimportant. In a game like Dragon's Age or Dragon's Dogma, it's much the same sort of thing. Um, your characters, their exact position is a lot less important. Uh, I mean, their proximity is important. Some of them are warriors, for example. But really what they're doing is they're going about playing their role. So you have the DPS mage, or you have the warrior that pulls aggro. Um, and they're just playing their role, and they're letting you sort out the specific moment-to-moment -moment tactics by you choosing where to position yourself relative to them rather than positioning them specifically relative to the enemy. Now, in a one-player game with just one avatar, uh, you position yourself relative to the enemy, you push through, and that's that. Um, but let's go ahead and talk a little bit about old-school games, where you would have a party, and you'd put people in the front row, and you'd put people in the back row. Or you might even have like a, a field where you'd push people forward and push people backwards in a turn-based sort of setup. I kind of miss that kind of tactical thinking. So what happens if we just come up with this basic idea where you have a party grid... You know, maybe it's maybe it's three by three, just for the sake of conversation. And you can put your characters on the party grid, right? And this might look familiar because lots of char lots of games do this. So here's your warrior, here's your here's your rogue, here's your mage or your cleric or whatever. And you got I don't know some scrawny prince dude in the back. Uh, I really don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, but the thing about this party setup is that it's relative not just to your position, but to your camera angle. Now your camera is far enough back that you can see this whole scene. You don't have any problem seeing both your people and the, and the monsters. We've got a long third-person camera. It's Batman Arkham Asylum long camera. Um, so when you decide you're going to turn to the right, what happens? Well, all of your characters turn in the same way. And if you decide you want to turn to the left, well, all your characters turn behind you. They stay in exact formation. And if you switch to control the, the, the thief, well, guess what? You're still controlling all of the formation relative to your thief, including if you push the warrior into an enemy. They will try their hardest to go into that enemy and strike along the way. They'll, they'll take their best actions while they're here. 
Now in order for this to work, we have a problem, and that problem is AI. Fundamentally, AI is bad. And I don't mean that AI is hard to program, and I don't mean that AI is stupid, I mean that it's a bad idea. <coughs> AI is a little bit hard to read. Even the best AI is unreliable from the point of view of the player. What we need is artificial stupidity in a way that the player can easily control. And that means that what these characters do, and how these characters tactically interact, is not something that's left up for some kind of heuristic. These characters don't uh, perform as freely as they do in other games. So we're the warrior in front for today. And let's go ahead and bring up this fact that we don't have just hit points, we have shielding points. Excuse me. I am, of course, sicker than I ever am when I'm not recording. So our, shielding's points, our shielding points start out empty, and we have a certain number of them depending on the quality of our sword's capabilities of blocking, depending on our shield, and perhaps depending on our fundamental skills. And they start hollow. But you hold down shift, and they quickly fill right up. And as they fill up, you get proper shielding points. Now, what do these shielding points mean? Well, obviously, if a slime attacks you, that means that you'll protect yourself. You'll have the opportunity to counter, like Batman style. You win. If they attack you and you click the counter button, then you go forward and you smack them and, and they get hurt. Um, and you use up one of your points. It also means that anyone in the slots behind you on the left or on the right is under your protection. So if this guy decides he's going to take a bite out of your mage, you can counter him before he gets his chance to hit your mage. As long as you have the proper points, and as long as your mage is still in position, because he might drift out of position if he's casting a spell and you're moving, or if he gets hit or knocked away, or any a number of other things that can take him out of that safe position. So if you're playing the mage, then your warrior is there specifically not just to cause harm, but also as your shield, and if you set him to be defensive, he will go ahead and, and every time he spends some of these points, he will spend a couple seconds, you know, a couple moments bringing it back up. Every time he gets a chance, he'll try and fill himself back up. The thief, on the other hand, he doesn't have any block points. He's got uh, maybe counter points, I guess you could call them. He's got these, these uh, little dagger points, and they fill up the same way, but much, much faster, and there are much, much fewer of them. So he can't really block, but what he can do is he can temporarily break out of formation and strike, and then return to formation really, really fast, like time pause fast. So he has the ability to do these these strikes that make him very, very valuable by him actually leaving the formation and returning to it, uh, rather than him blocking and staying in formation. And you might have like a pirate character who's got a pistol, and rather than counter things, he's got a sword in one hand and a pistol in the other. And rather than a countering attack, he would have bullets. Uh, and when the enemy decides they're going to attack him, your counter, when you right-click to counter, uh, rather than countering, you would shoot them dead. But your bullets take a long time to reload. So maybe at that point you switch formations, and you put them in the back rather than the front. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to have this locked together formation where you can still move around. So if you wanted to go ahead and skate around to the right and try and attack from the flank, you can still do that just fine, and your party will follow you, and they will stay ahead of you, and they will stay in the right position, and you'll all be over on the flank, and you'll be striking quite freely. But you have to keep in mind the state of all of your characters. You've got to know how many of these points you've got. You've got to know how many of these points he's got. You've got to know if the mage is in the middle of casting a spell that he can't move for. Um, you've got to keep track of these things. And sometimes you'll want to break formation, and sometimes that's going to be taboo because they'll, they'll get eaten alive. I think this is the kind of combat I would like. Uh, this is more Batman Arkham Asylum-y than I originally intended. Because when I was originally thinking about this game, I was planning on doing a lot of diving. Uh, it was very Dark Souls-y. But you can't really do that with a party. Um, your party members will get either eaten alive or it'll be very boring. Um, all of that, ooh, yeah, duck, dodge, dive, all that stuff is great if it's you 
doing all the ducking and dodging. Watching someone else, you know, flin at each other. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. Um, and that wasn't the Konami code. That was swashbuckling in a movie. Uh, that's not really very intense because you have your own stuff to worry about. In order to make your party members matter uh, from a moment-to-moment -moment basis, to feel like they're integrated with you, you have to make them so that either they're turn-based, so that you could spend a certain amount of time on each character, or they have to be locked into your avatar. And I think that the only way I can think of to lock them into your avatar is to put them in a formation where you can clearly see all of their states and make their states very clear. There's no mysteries here. Um, none of the characters will act out of uh, out of out of ten. They they won't, they won't go off and do their own thing unless it's very clear that that's what you've told them to do. Uh, either by either either by programming of some kind in their tactics menu, or by temporarily pausing the game and telling them to do something. Um, either way. This is more than simply tapping. Uh, like uh, one of the things that I don't like about the the Batman games is that it's like, oh, they're going to attack. Quick, press counter. Oh, look, he's going to attack. Oh, quick, press counter. And so to try and get out of out of that boredom, what they do is they introduce these enemies that have these shields, right? And it's like, oh, I got the shield. And you're like, oh, great, this is so much fun. Um, okay, I guess I'll stand here and then I'll battering your shield away. Oh, I gotta press counter, so never mind. Okay, well now I gotta batter. Oh, I gotta press counter, so never mind. And I gotta batter. Oh, I'm not gonna... But the good news is, we don't have that problem, because what we have here is an RPG engine. And RPGs are all about stats colliding. So, we aren't talking about finding the perfect uh, openings. We're talking about setting it up so that our stats dwindle in a very specific way that is easy to understand in combat. These here are counters you can always see, and they're always very easy to understand. You always know who's covered and who's not covered, uh, and you can always clearly see what's going to happen at any given time, and it's not about always pressing with the right speed or always doing the most perfect um, you know, action moves. It's about setting things up so that your enemies and you can grind against each other and your stats can both drop, and the idea is that your stats drop slower because you've planned it better. Uh, of course, there's still plenty of running around and all that stuff, um, still plenty of freedom, still plenty of countering, but it's not an action game, it's an RPG. It's an action RPG. I guess it is an action game. It's not like a... it's not a Batman-style game where everything is, is very binary, you either win or you lose. In this game, if you don't block a slime, no one's going to, to die, you're just going to lose some hit points. Um, so that's my idea for how my game will work. And the big reason I wanted to do it like this is because I really want party members. Um, I hate this this trend of all of, the, of these games that either don't have party members or the party members don't matter. Um, I don't think I've ever cared about what my party members were doing tactically in Dragon Age or in Mass Effect. Um, they just... Uh, it doesn't really matter. The only time you ever need them is when the when the mission requires a specific party member. Otherwise, they're basically interchangeable. Uh, maybe that's just because the difficulty in those games is too low. But either way, this will tie the party members into your experience a lot more tightly, and you'll care about which party members you've brought along and where you've put them. With that said, I hope that uh, if you listened this long, you put up with my wheezy voice and uh, maybe have an opinion or learn something or whatever. That's it. Have a good one.